everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's Jackie. And remember, in 2022, I am going to I go have second. not forgotten. I know. It's not 2022 Every time I yet, think though. about it, actually. I do, too. Do you want to start that when we record the first episode for 2022? Yeah. Okay. Kay. Sounds okay. like a plan. Make a note. Put it in the notes. In the show <laughs> notes. The notes of show. Yes. The, the show about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we pick a topic and discuss relevant research related to the field. And this week, we're going to be talking all about sustainability. And since I haven't gotten my recycle out to the curb in over a month, we thought maybe we should bring <laughs> in a guest. And so happy to join <laughs> us to in... bring out Presumably. The bring, yeah, <laughs> happy to join us just to bring out my recycling for me. <laughs> no, she has lots to say on the topic. It's Dr. Megan Martineau, who's here in the studio with us. Hi, guys. First time speaker in the studio. Oh! Yeah. Yes. Very excited to be here. I have a lot of emotions running through me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm obviously very excited because this is an area that I'm really passionate about. I'm human, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but the other piece that is going on is I, I'm just like really proud of you guys looking Aww. around at the the content that you've made and what you've done with ABA Inside Track Aww. is really, you Thanks, know, especially girl. with the pandemic of thinking about how accessible it is, the high quality of it. That's why I read it. The topics. It's really, I hope you guys are patting yourselves on the back every now and then. Because Thank you. That's nice. That's why I read it. Yeah, but it's, it's true. Whenever I listen to your episodes, I'm like, wow. A listener. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I knew somebody must listen to this. We keep doing it. Not only is she a speaker, (laughs) but she's a listener as well. (laughs) Hey, we know it's good for you, so why don't we all do it? (laughs) Oh, that's so nice. Meg? We'll have to recycle some compliments later on in the show. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to carbon neutral some positive statements. You've lost it. (laughs) In case anyone's wondering, we did do a previous episode on environmental sustainability. It was back number 27. (gasps) Ooh. Whoa. So way back in the archives, it was called It's Not Easy Being Green, in yes. case anyone wants to go back and check that one out. Mm-hmm. But this is a different one, an yep, updated one. one. Yes, this is. We're talking about two new articles, as well as Meg's, you know, your experience mm-hmm. in the area of sustainability and your level of expertise that you're bringing to our conversation. At the beginning of the show is any indication. I don't, I don't have any. Uh, I've only recently started being forced, I should say, <laughs> to do more environmentally conscious engaging environmentally conscious behaviors so it's been okay that bad Hmm? has it been that bad no i i i I, kind of reading through the articles you know some of the ones we've got to get to a habit as fast as possible i kind of reflected but oh half these stupid (laughs) nabby pamby recycling enviro (laughs) friendly things or sandwich bags now (laughs) i'm just used to i'm used to washing out my Sand with my reusable sandwich bag and our compost. The kids are all good at the composting. I love composting. Yuck. It sounds like go- Diana's been at work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although Diana has yet to learn that she needs to turn off the fans when she is not sleeping <laughs> next to the fans. Mm. They should have just stay on through the day. Touche. Well, small steps. I really like small that steps. air circulation. Small steps. That's right. Small steps. That's small right. Steps. Which we don't have yeah. in this room currently. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Diana would like to turn the fan on right now. I sure would. <laughs> and I'm sure the audience would love hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Meg, before we get into kind of your, you know, your, your more formal introduction, mm-hmm. I just want to let all our audience know the two articles that we'll mainly be discussing. The first is The Recycling Solution, How I Increased Recycling on Dilworth Road by Keller, Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1991. Before I, can I just tell you that Keller always has the best titles? Well, uh, spoiler alert, it's not you, not the Keller you're thinking of. Oh, yeah. Junk, it's not. But, <laughs> junk. <laughs> but he's you know he's related, so it could, be gene- mm-hmm. it could be genetic ability to create article titles. But mm-hmm. that is a great title. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. It's pretty to the point, right? Yeah. I would say. <laughs> like, I'm going to come to your house on Dilworth Road. We don't really know. What the generality is? of these. It's like findings, a children's however. book road, too. Yeah. 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 It's like, where's my favorite place in the world, Dilworth Road? Yeah. Title. To think that I saw it on Dilworth Road. <laughs> anyway, sorry. And positive reinforcement is just the beginning. Associative Learning Principles for Energy Efficiency and Climate Sustainability by Schneider and Sanguinetti from Energy Research and Social Science, 
from 2021. That's the one to read. That's the the one. I I don't want to jump too far ahead before we get into like your your introduction, Mm -hmm, Meg. Yeah. This article does everything I love in an article of like, I want to learn about a topic. I wish there were an article that just told me all I need to know about the topic. And yay, (laughs) this one did. Yeah, they did an incredible job with this article. And, And the journal in which they published it too is really important for our field to expand kind of our message beyond just behavior analysis to a broader discipline so i've never even heard of this article this this journal before oh well this is a good one to get into because it's it's a non-psychological one with people with no familiarity with uh, behavior analysis and you can tell in the way that it was written what a beautiful job they did to try and translate what we know and do into language that is concise and can be understood by the general public, which is really where I think the rubber hits the road sometimes in kind of disseminating what we do. You know, I do have a girl crush on Sh- Susan Snyder. Uh, yeah, I have more than a crush on her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Sorry. bearing our soul here, she's gonna listen to this too. <laughs> Well, just so she Hi, knows. Susan. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Oh, so we Ma- love you. So, Meg, please, you know, we sort of yeah. introduced you as our sustainability expert <clears throat> guest, but but tell the listeners kind of a little bit more about yourself yeah. and your background. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, yeah, I'm from the New England area. I grew up in Massachusetts in this beautiful town. And, you know, as a young kid, I just fell in love with the outdoors. I think it really happened through soccer. Like, I just loved being outside and that feeling of the fresh air in your lungs and all of that. Just the connection to nature. It was just always really there for me. And Meg, I have to interrupt. I've yeah. gotten a little bit more into soccer myself over the past year. <laughs> so is it causation or correlation when you start doing more sustainable behaviors that you get oh, more God. into soccer? I'm a little <laughs> worried now. I don't know. It's yeah. all, all together. The whole constellation of things works out well. If that's what does the trick, that's what does soccer, the trick, right? composting. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't know. If they, if I, if they go too, too far in yeah. one direction or the other, I'm going to have to... <laughs> Take a drastic action. Gardening. But I, I think I'm like many people where I, I feel a deep connection to nature. And even as a young kid, we went on a lot of trips. I was very lucky to go on a lot of trips. And we went to Yosemite one year. And I just remember just being totally amazed that this is this is where we live, right? We have access to everything we need. And even at that time, you know, they were teaching us about, you know, anti-littering campaigns and things like that. It just never made sense to me that people weren't taking care of where we live. So I've always kind of had that passion. And then it just kind of grew throughout the years through hiking and camping. My husband really exposed me to that. And we have two kids now. So taking care of the planet is obviously like critically important for us. But then, you know, when I was in college, my mom, she, one of the best things she did as a parent, I feel like it's a good little strategy for the future for me is encouraged me to trial out different job opportunities. So one summer I did waitressing. I bombed at that. I bet you'd be a great waitress. I was, it's not for me. (laughs) You should tip tip heavily. I did social work one summer, but then I did one year working in a camp with a student diagnosed with autism. And that's where I kind of fell in love with this field. Ended up working at the New England Center for Children, got a great training there, and fell in love with the field of behavior analysis. So I've kind of had these two passions that have been on like two train tracks together. And then the real pinnacle of where it like hit me over the head of like, okay, I, I need to start doing more on this was I work in the public schools. And there was a sign up that one of the students had made. And it was just clearly this homemade sign that it was like, we need to do something about the planet. It's warming at a rapid pace. And, you know, my behavior analytic had is like, okay, I got to find this student and reinforce this behavior. So I sat with her. And the first thing she said to me was, if only we could change people's behavior. It was like the universe like, hitting me over the head. Right. With like, what are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. this is the social problem that you need to start mm-hmm. tending to. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like I've been very lucky to uncover that this is my passion and that I'm really devoted to creating changes I hope to see in the places that I live and work and to really use these tools for good. And I really have a vision where we can create a world where humans joyfully engage in behaviors that are healthy for them and the planet. Because we have so much knowledge at our fingertips now, we just need to start executing it. And so part of being on here is I hope I'm a source of inspiration for some of your audience members to feel empowered at the potential positive impacts that you can have in your own communities. Because, spoiler alert, as a behavior analyst, we know how to do it. And it's actually quite easy 
dare mm-hmm. I say it, we already have the training in order to do it. It's just applying our skills to a different social problem. Mm-hmm. And you did it in your public yeah. school. Yes. Yeah. I'll happy to walk through. That I think story. you should. Give, yeah. yeah. yeah I think to, you should give a little, a I little. Think that's background. a great place to start. Yeah. Yeah. So after I met with this wonderful student, we decided, okay, let's take a look. Like, what can we do in, in the school? And one of the things that I knew that was going on was that the administration was looking to get composting up and running in the cafeteria, but there was really no one that had, you know, taken the initiative or lead to do it. And that's, you know, the downside of this is that all of this is out of, I'm volunteering my time, right? In order to do this, there aren't a lot of structures in place or contingencies. I'm not getting paid for it. No one's monitoring my behavior. I'm really doing this out of the goodness of my heart. But I think as this climate crisis continues, there are so many people like me and the more activists and people I meet, they're devoted to doing this, especially younger generations. So I really think we have the tools to fuel this solution and this kind of change that is is coming in upon us. So anyway, I was like, okay, this is a new social problem. Let's put on my behavior analytic hat. <clears throat> it was a trucker hat, obviously. Yeah, I like trucker <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at what are high impact behaviors. What's the target behavior going to be? And I it happened to coincide with what is on the drawdown list. And for those of you unfamiliar with drawdown, it's a great resource. It was a book that came out where it's the top 100 solutions to climate change. So it's the climate scientists who have done the research who know these are the things that if we execute them, we can actually reach the point of drawdown where the amount of carbon that we're emitting is is reduced. Mm -hmm. We're actually, you know, capturing more carbon than we're uh, emitting or greenhouse gases, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's not just carbon. So the number three solution was reduction of food waste. So I had, I knew I had access to the cafeteria. I'm in there a lot because there's a lot of problem behavior. Snaking (laughs) food. Yeah. (laughs) Eating snacks. Where are those chicken (laughs) nuggets? Pudding Um, cups. (laughs) Exactly. And then I just fell into the habit that I have as a, a behavioral consultant. I observed the behaviors. I, you know, took baseline data. I spent time with the people that it would impact the most. So the custodians and lunch staff and the administrators. And I asked them a lot of questions about response effort. Like, how can this make this easier? And, and establishing myself as a conditional reinforcer, right? You want people to like you and feel like they're, they're heard and understood. So like communication was key. I kept the principal and the PTO and the DPW informed of what we were doing. And I, maybe that sounds like a lot, but it didn't feel like a lot because mm-hmm. that's just what we do. Mm-hmm. And the overwhelming consensus was just, you know, I was a bit nervous to do this. And quite honestly, because you think of climate change, it's very emotionally charged. feels like it could become political. But I found that there's overwhelming community support to people are looking for solutions. People mm-hmm. want these things to happen and these changes to occur, especially younger kiddos. Mm. So we we rolled it out. We scheduled an all school assembly where we just show do some video modeling, show a video of what what we're doing and why that we're just doing composting in the cafeteria. And then I used resources like Doug McKenzie Moore has this book, Fostering Sustainable Behavior, which is fantastic. Mm. This is something that is a great resource to look at that already has a lot of interventions that have proven to be successful. And one of them is using pledges to have people pledge to what we we chose or I chose reduction of waste. Mm -hmm. And the trick with pledges is you need to make them not coercive. Mm -hmm. So people need to want to to sign up and not feel like they're being forced to Mm -hmm. and to make them public. So I gave every kid in the school a pledge that they brought home and they could sign with their parents and the ones that returned them they were eligible for prizes when I did maintenance checks Mm -hmm. later in the year. And so, you know, this is just me. So I'm just, I'm picking what I can do that's manageable for me. And I knew I couldn't actually go to every kid's home (laughs) and monitor, (laughs) did you actually reduce the amount of waste? It was, it's more, I was relying on their verbal report. Mm. And, and I can't tell you how fun those days were where it was. It was. Well, you showed up at people's houses and looked yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where I was like <laughs> sneaking through the window. Just kidding. It was amazing because our cafeteria, it's like a big cafeteria and there's a stage. So I was on stage with a mic calling kids down. You would have thought it was The Price is Right. It's the closest thing. It's like a lifelong dream for me to be on The Price is Right. Kids are running down, giving each other high fives. They were so excited about it. And it really created like this huge buzz 
mm-hmm. in the school. The community was supportive. The PTO wanted to get involved. And it's amazing. It's just making connections with like-minded folks, right? That so many people wanted to support this effort as well. And the outcome just spoke for itself. We reduced trash by 50%. 70% of the kids signed pledges. The school was buzzing. We had like a green team that was going wild with ideas. Mm. They, they, like I had kind of just sparked, like I put an SD out there and now with all these other chains of events were happening. They were writing letters to the city. One thing that I didn't anticipate was that the kids won an award for what they did. So it was like, these were all things. Like, the community yeah. was looking for these things. It's not like yeah. I designed yes. that. Yeah. And so it was like, <laughs> okay, I just did this, lit- to me, a little thing, but it created this big cultural shift in the school, mm-hmm. you know, quite quickly. And one of the more heartwarming things was I didn't anticipate all the social reinforcement that I would get from the kids. Mm-hmm. Right. Of that authentic relationship of seeing kids actually execute and kind of train them to be little mini behavior analysts in a way. (laughs) But they're so enthusiastic and to see them be part of that change and know that they have power over what, you know, their environment is like. That was really like, you talk about like highly rewarding reinforcers, like the quality of that was, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that got me hooked, you know? And then you know that who knows what those kids will do, but maybe some of them could be environmental leaders. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is, to take away was how it really wasn't that hard and it was actually kind of fun Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and why like kind of why behavior analysis is groomed for this Mm -hmm. right it's just another social problem you know we're systematic we do our research we don't need to we know how to measure yeah exactly Mm -hmm. we know how to measure we establish ourselves as reinforcers analyze and minimize response effort Mm -hmm. and like celebrate the success and they're dying for more stuff you know so i think this is an example of taking what we know and doing the best we can within our communities to make like a big change. Mm-hmm. And I, I hope to inspire more people to do the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, that, that's excellent, Meg. And, and, I, and I think it gets to the, to the heart of a lot of the sustainability initiatives, at least discussed in, in you know, the articles. I, I certainly don't have as much uh, background information as, as, if, as you do, or I think any of you do, but really kind of reading through it, so much of it did get at the point of, it's not about, okay, everybody, we got to sit down. We've got to solve all the big, like climate change. What are we going to do? Go. Cause that is one of those overwhelming. It's like, mm, I'm going to bang yeah. this on the next gonna, hour. I'm just going to, I'm going to hope I'm solving dead it. before it's a real problem is actually what I think I'm going to do. I'm just going to, I'll die and then I don't have to deal with it. So I'll just waste, waste, waste. It's more about what are some small things? Cause like you said, so much of sustainability becomes mm-hmm. this political issue, but why does it need to be phrased in a way that's political? If, if you ask, wouldn't it be great to cut down on food waste? Mm hmm. Very, I, I, I can't imagine there are lots of people like, no, we need more food waste. We need as much as possible. I think most people would say, that sounds, that sounds great. I'd like to do that. What can we do? You know, they'd, they'd at least totally. be interested, yes. if not willing to change their behavior. Yes. There's no reason to get into politics. You can just, and that's been what's been recommended is mm-hmm. to actually just sp- specify we're trying to reduce the amount of waste in our tra- mm-hmm. uh, trash and teach kids about the waste stream. And we know this from Hefferlein in the, the Schneider article, mm-hmm. too, that humans are influenced by their consequences and they don't realize it, Mm -hmm. right? So you don't need to convince people to do these things. You can just put these contingencies in place and it changes things. Like, for instance, like with that example at the elementary school, you know, there were some, you know, people who maybe would be reluctant to do composting, but because it was there, they're like, oh, this is what I do. Like, and then then they just throw it in. You don't need to have a conversation about that, right? Like, we know how to change human behavior. Yeah. You I, just make it super easy. Right. I, mean, I think about yeah, recy- recycling totally. in the I mean, town. That's what the recycling research yeah. says too. Yeah. But I, I do have a, just a logistical question. So before this, there wasn't any composting happening at the school? No. So how did you get that set up? So that, I, I do have to speak to the efforts of Newton and the DPW where they have worked to provide funding to have companies... Yep that per, uh, offer composting to mm-hmm. come to the schools. Great. So, so you like was hooked in. He was in there before. To administration yeah. in the school. They worked with the Department yes. of Public Works and said, yeah, we could swing by and pick up the compost. Mm-hmm. Y- y- pretty much. Mm-hmm. Pretty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Cliff Notes version of it. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know that like that's another piece, right, is like the advocacy of like having mm-hmm. some of those systems in place. But I think there's so many behaviors 
you know, with climate change, you can get lost in the complexity or you can embrace it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are so many topographies of behavior that if you look at that, you do have access to that you don't need to have these big systems in place to actually just kind of hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. And that's what I hope people take away is to maybe reflect on your own behavior. Take a look at just give yourself a baseline for two weeks. What are you doing on a, a day to day basis? What is the impact of those actions? And be realistic. Like, what is one thing maybe that I could change, you know, in my home just for myself or in my community? And it's quite surprising. There, I mean, there's so many things that we can can do. And, and it's really it requires a commitment for the long haul on this. So that's why it's really easy to throw your hands up in the air and say, it's too big. I can't do it. I'm mm-hmm. going to stop. Right. But that's one of the worst things we can do. And I've, I've been there myself. Mm-hmm. Like I've ever. It's a common thing. There's a term for it called climate anxiety, where it's just it's just too much, right? I love that they have a term for it. They're like, we're yeah. all feeling it. Let's just yeah. name it yeah. so we can get it out in the open <laughs> and then move forward. Right. Yeah. Because sorry, because really, it's about selecting a behavior and then making that change. Get it under habit, and that takes time, right? Mm. So you have to be graceful with yourself in this process. And then once you feel like you've got it down, then add on something more. Mm-hmm. Like we, mm-hmm. we can't, you can't change it all overnight. Yeah. So Meg, when we talk about sort of sustainability research and, and work in sustainability, we're usually not talking about behavior analysis, though behavior analysis does have surprisingly a, a pretty robust history sort of in the early mm-hmm. days, kind of the eco, the ecological movement mm-hmm. back in the seventies. And then I guess we just decided that wasn't for us or we changed yeah. our mind i, I don't really got I, too hard we had climate anxiety yeah i don't yeah no well i think because back then they would have been thinking about i think global cooling was the thing in the 70s mm-hmm. so i go well, that that still could be climate anxiety they just went the they went the other direction i guess like it's getting too cold i'm out of here <laughs> where's my jack and it does feel like so many initiatives not all initiatives i, I don't want to paint with too broad mm-hmm. a brush because there's so many people you know whether it's sort of you know at the district level at the national or global level making you know you know, big changes, but it does feel like so many of the systems that get put up, it's like, we made a lottery, or we made a reward system, and we put it in place, and it helped with getting rid of animal waste, or it helped with recycling, but it was expensive, so we stopped, and then people stopped recycling, and we just sort of went on our merry way. Mm -hmm. It does kind of feel that, I don't know if it's because of lack of having behavior analysts, you know, being a part of the conversation Mm -hmm. as much as they used to, or whether it's because it's become political, but so so much of these initiatives are sort of about like a very, very weak understanding of human mm-hmm. behavior. Like they understand the idea of incentives and that's it. You know, mm-hmm. it's just economics and then then I'm out of ideas and then we give up. I mean, do you see that when you're looking at a lot of these initiatives as well? Or is that sort of just what kind of gets more popularly like reported? I'm, what, yeah, I think you're, you're really speaking to the point that the general population doesn't have a broader understanding of associative learning principles mm-hmm. or behavior analysis, right? Mm-hmm. And that you know, we have been within our own field. We have thankfully people in the seventies and eighties who have done a lot of work, but right now we're at a point where we really need to make the point and continue to push for more interdisciplinary research showing that the the utility of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was actually an article that came out very recently in 2020 in the journal of sustainability by Biglin et al. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at what I was just kind of describing at the elementary school, these community-based interventions where you're actually getting a reduction in greenhouse gases and monitoring for this data, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. seeing whether or not you have an impact on the amount of greenhouse gases you're emitting. So looking more like like more global, like, like, you know, chemical outcomes rather than, say, behavioral outcomes. No, it's community interventions Mm -hmm. using behavioral tools. No, but in terms of measuring, when you said greenhouse gases, do you mean mean they were measuring, like, carbon emission? They were measuring, like, how much waste they were sorting properly, kind of? This one, they were looking at electricity, refrigeration, or food, seeing the impacts impacts of those. And, I mean, the the bad news is that there's no peer-reviewed experimental evaluations of community-wide interventions to reduce greenhouse gases involving okay. these things. So I think people are are doing what they can, right? And maybe with these small little pockets of research, but there's a group, I think it's called Values to Action, that they're really trying to make the case that there needs to be funding mm-hmm. in order to get these initiatives in place to show that behavioral research is is needed to kind of show, you know, you can make an environmental policy, but are people going to actually follow it? 
Right. Well, and I mean, does it have an actual impact in the community? Right. Yeah. And even when they do, like I know recently I saw some some ads talking and they're like the kind of the ads you usually think of when you think of ecologically sound principles. And it's like, oh, it's a lot of clear water and like children saying, well, you've got to help us. You know, you know mm-hmm. the things that make you, you, you know, feel you know, Kind of, kind of those Pavlovian responses. I think I actually mentioned yep. in the in the Schneider with, oh, you're tugging at my heartstrings. I feel so bad. And then I'm looking. It's like these businesses are going to do the best they can. And I hear, I hear businesses and environment. I'm automatically very skeptical. Mm-hmm. And then I think it was like Amazon is doing. I'm like, I don't trust. Mm-hmm. I don't trust anyone involved. Yeah. In this. And they may be doing, you know, amazing work, but it just doesn't feel like any positive, sustainable principle is going to. The, the reinforcers just won't be there for most businesses because it's so much of what I think I see as, you know, from my limited knowledge as potentially damaging to the mm-hmm. environment has to do with more kind of like larger corporation behavior, which, again, might be true, but also might mm-hmm. be dangerous in that it's like, well, there's nothing I can do. There's too many big businesses. I'm just one mm-hmm. person. I can't change my behavior or it won't matter. So, you know, we're dealing with it feels like we're dealing with a lot. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm getting anxiety. I'm getting sustainability yeah, no, anxiety. I'm sorry, yeah, everyone. Yeah, I'm bringing us okay. down. I know. <laughs> Bring it back. Take a breath. Uh, there's a lot there to unpack. You know, I, I, you, you're not wrong about any of that, right? That it's like corporations need to be held accountable for what they're doing. And there's, I, I feel like a two-pronged approach, right? That we need to have have that, but also realize the influence of changing our own behavior. Maybe a bottom-up approach, mm-hmm. I, as, I, as I would describe it. That too much of what I worry about is people end up falling on this line of relying on government in order to implement a thing. And I think that's very dangerous, mm-hmm. right? That we're waiting for someone else to solve the problem. And Susan, in her article, too, talks about embracing this bottom-up approach of what we know about ubiquitous things about human behavior. You know, and we haven't gotten into... All, all of what I hope to talk about today, but one of those is just the influence of what our individual actions have on the people around us, mm. right? And how much of how many people are actually doing that now and not to discount that because it's very easy. We're humans. Mm. Our brains are wired to attend to negative information more than they are to positive information. So it's very easy to shut down when you start thinking about this, but to more think about the collective effort of all of us making these changes and the ripple effects that that has in your communities, that's what's going to be more represented in the government and then the corporations i I, to be honest i don't have an answer Mm -hmm. for that because it's the same type of thing i I find some of those commercials distressing Mm -hmm. you know as well what if we called it like a butterfly effect or something yeah i mean i'm just thinking off the top of my head (laughs) (laughs) just kidding (laughs) yeah but yeah it it really should be happening on all levels right yes yeah, yeah yeah One of the things I was hoping we could talk about mm-hmm. is awareness-based campaigns. So when we talk about like being mischaracterized of behavior analysis, is that many well-intentioned activists and researchers are continuing to focus on what are the aversive consequences of climate change. Mm-hmm. And as mm. I've kind of jumped into trying to work with political you know, or environmental organizations, it's everyone's coming to it at the best of intentions, right? Like, the, and their assumption is. If people know about this, if they know that the air quality is bad, Mm. they're going to change their behavior, right? But we, in our field, we know, like, knowing doesn't equal doing. Like, Mm. I know that I shouldn't eat peanut butter cups, but, like, if they're in my house, no, you gone. So delicious. I mean, you can occasionally (laughs) eat some. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I I don't need to know more about the nutritional value of, We're a bunch of enablers here. You're not going (laughs) to... And the awareness-based campaign, I'm I'm worried with that about like two kind of things that there's it's not an efficient use of time, mm-hmm. and there's growing support for solutions to climate change, and it's even more prevalent among younger generations. And the other is this ostrich effect, mm-hmm. where it's this well-documented idea that people stop attending to information because stimuli are too consistently aversive. Mm. So you think of like an ostrich putting their head in the sand to remain safe or avoiding looking at a bill that mm. comes in. You know, I'm the queen of it. Are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. think that's, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Mary. I mean, I, I can't think of a single headline or ad campaign about environmental change that hasn't just immediately made me feel like, well, either someone else sounds like they've got a good handle on this. I'll just yeah. keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. There's, you know, there's no need for change. Or this sounds too hard. There's nothing I can do about it. Everything they're describing is impossible. I quit. I'll just, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing, and I'll hope to die, you know, before mm-hmm, it gets mm-hmm. too bad. 
which is depressing because I used to always want to live forever. Now, like, nah, yeah. if I make it to, you know, 65, I'm probably doing okay. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to go any farther. It's too depressing after that, I think. You know, with, oh, this, this is the year, everybody, where it becomes impossible to change everything. It's like, oh, okay. That's sad. I, it, oh, when it, you're talking about the, the, all the, sca- the yeah, intergovernmental it, panel on it, climate change. It just feels very, yeah. like, you're right. Like, well, if, if you came out of the panel saying, everyone, here are some solutions we came up with mm-hmm. that you can do at home. It's, oh, well, tell me those solutions. That sounds, the response effort sounds low. And, and in many cases is yeah. low. But when it's just, here's the bad news. Don't you want to know the bad news? Like, no, I don't. I'm just going to tune. No, thank you. You've, yeah. you've made this whole swap right, it's avoidance of yeah, the, the yeah. Whole, and not mm-hmm. just avoidance of i think the one report or the one article but it becomes you know you start kind of you know anti-pairing with the entire movement of like i don't want to hear anything about environmental anything because i know i'm just going to get yelled at and i know i'm just going to be told that i have to change all my behaviors and i don't think i can do it and there's nothing i can do anyway and everything's doom and, gl- mm-hmm. and you sort of just again i'm getting i'm getting my climate anxiety it's it's, yeah. it's coming through yeah. You don't have to answer. It's not a question, Meg. No. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just no, freaking I, out you know, on, on as, Mike here. Sorry. To be, to be honest, some <laughs> of the thoughts I'm having are in our small groups of behavior analysts that are devoted to this. What is the most effective use of time? Because we have tools to help with anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like we could be producing content to calm people down. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the process I went through with myself this past year. And it has worked. Mm-hmm. But is it better to do that? Is it better to allocate our time for research? Is it, you know, like mm-hmm. of deciding how to be the most efficient with the time that we have? Mm-hmm. The good news is, is that we still have time. Mm-hmm. There's hope, you know, at some point there, there might not be, but there's still hope now. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I think it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm an eternal optimist, maybe to a downfall, but I, if, if, if you get out there and talking to people doing this work and you talk to young kids and younger generations, people are ready for a change. Mm-hmm. They're sick yeah. of the way it is, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this th- could easily go to another conversation about the way our society is and the capitalistic structure of telling us we need more, more, more all the time. Mm-hmm. But people mm-hmm. are ready to pull back mm-hmm. and have a more simplified life. And I, I do believe there's a lot of blessings. I know the pandemic has been hard and challenging. I don't want to, you know, take away from that. But I, a lot of it's been an opportunity for people to reset and to realize exactly how much do you need? You mm. know, what's enough? Mm. You know, all the right. toilet paper. I need is a what couch, I need. Take it all. Animal Crossing. And probably just, you know, Netflix. food delivery. Exactly. And then I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Netflix and Virgin. Urban. You know, I saw something not too long ago that said, think about 30 years ago, everyone smoked in a restaurant mm-hmm. and you had to say smoking or non smoking, right? Now, at least where we live, it's unheard of that you would smoke in a restaurant, mm-hmm. right? It's disgusting. Mm-hmm. And no one is, is going to allow that to happen. And that change has been in not that long a period of time. And, but the entire societal paradigm shift has occurred with respect to smoking mm-hmm. indoors. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's no reason to think that this couldn't happen exactly. with regard to other behavior that we right now think is completely the norm. Mm-hmm. That that could be totally different. I mean, mm-hmm. going to work was the norm, right? And then it wasn't. <laughs> so, I mean. Right. <laughs> yeah. But how much meat we consume, Completely. right? Or what we do with our waste or mm-hmm. what kind of car we drive or what the expectations mm-hmm. are with respect to carpooling, things mm-hmm. like that. All of those things could very easily change mm-hmm. 10, 20, 30 years. Sure. And now is actually a perfect time to kind of reflect on your own behavior because there's been research to show that I think it was in behavioral climate policy where I read that one of the best times to shift your behavioral patterns is when you move. Mm-hmm. So like if you're moving from a location and you think about it, you're resetting everything, mm-hmm. right? Like what grocery store am I going to go to? What am I going to do here? Like I would kind of call that like a behavioral break, maybe mm-hmm. like that you could apply that to this situation here that we've a lot of things have changed. So now is a good time to reassess and think about, OK, what is the impact? Like how how am I going to reenter? Right. Like, and how we reenter does matter in a way. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. And I think people are more conscious of that than they ever have been. I know that I switched from using my what I used to love as my shampoo, my plastic container shampoo that I squirt in my hand and mm. use a lot and like lather forever. You lather rinse you go, girl. and repeat. Lather and repeat. I did. <laughs> I repeated, <laughs> repeated. But I switched to bar soap. Without a container. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I can still kind of get the same lather, but mm-hmm. I like it now. It mm-hmm. took me like three mm-hmm. bars mm-hmm. to get there. Go, Jackie. Right? Rub but I, haven't, I haven't changed my conditioner yet. I'm not there yet. But 
That's okay. It's Small hard. steps, Sometimes right? It's oily. That's a hard one. Yeah. I had a hard yeah. time with that. Rob has a bar sh- soap for his beard. A beard Ooh. shampoo soap, yes. <laughs> look it's a bar at you. I had the hair, See, look at you, the Rob, hair you bar, don't, too. Don't get, don't I know, I know. yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> I give but myself no credit. celebrate your success. Yeah, I know. You do. <laughs> but do you really need a bar soap for your beard? Apparently. Uh, I, I did yes. some research on I it. Know. You want to, you got to. Mm-hmm. I know, you got to take care of that. got to take care of it. It's hair, you know, it's oil know, on your I'm face. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was just joking with you. Yo, back off, Jackie, all right? <laughs> it's a very nice beard. So right? mean. You have one of the best beards. Oh, so kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, son. Well, I guess it's that soap. <laughs> it must be. Well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's kind of just keep drilling down into some of the specifics that are out there in the research and that Meg has for our audience. And when we're done, we'll probably have solved this whole climate kerfuffle, I think. What I do you see why not? What do you say? One all hour. Right. Let's do it. All right. We'll be, we'll be right back with that. be a bcba sure we all do now you can come to regis college in weston mass to get your graduate degree choose from any one of these courses masters of science in applied behavior analysis masters of science in special education dual degree in special ed and aba or be eligible for your post master certificate you can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking with Dr. Meg Martineau about sustainability. And before we continue our discussion, I want to remind our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is listen to the show and head over to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash getceus. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. You need to enter in some information, including two secret code words. We have some secret guest code words this week from Dr. Martineau. And the first is drawdown. Two words or one word. It's two words technically, but we won't care if you want to use it as a one word. D-R-A-W-D-O-W-N. Is that that movie where Kurt Russell's a firefighter? I was under the impression it was what you call it when someone's really bad at Pictionary and they just need to draw down a little more so that you can score. But Meg, you said this actually is this is a scientific term. Yeah, that climate scientists use to describe the point at which we're taking out more greenhouse gases than we're emitting into the air. God, yes. it's a it's a goal. It's a goal. We can do it. We have the solutions. Uh-huh. We have it at our fingertips. Just All right. Just got to do it. You mentioned it earlier in the episode as well. So bonus points if remember where it was in the episode. Though you don't need to tell us. You can just remember it and <laughs> think positive thoughts about yourself. Draw down. All right. Well, so Meg, we discussed a lot of your own work and your own you know, you know, background and research that, that you've either done or read about sustainable sustainability and sustainable behavior let's talk a little bit more specifically about the articles why don't we start with not fred keller but or scott jake J- jacob keller who you know they really buried the lead on the author of this article i read about half of it and i was like this is i know it's 1991 you know it's an older article but this is kind of written like Maybe like a little kid wrote it. <laughs> and then, hey, there it is in the footnotes. A little kid wrote this article. Yeah. <laughs> if you try hard enough, anyone can get published. That's, right? tr- that's true. I know. <laughs> it made me feel really I was like, I should have published something before, you know, in elementary school. Oh, well, in reading this, Megan, I don't know if this is why you wanted us to, to discuss it. It's a very simple article. You know, it's just a, a young boy who had some aspirations about helping people re- increase recycling. It was just a very simple kind of a, f- a feedback procedure where he wrote notes to his neighbors, letting mm-hmm. them know this is how many people recycled this week. I, it didn't say whether he Xeroxed those notes or whether he mm-hmm. literally wrote note after note after note for all of his neighbors on was West Dilworth or East Dilworth. I can't remember. One of the yeah. Dilworth roads. Yeah, I assumed he hand wrote them just because the it's way they were written. Yeah, And it was the 90s. <laughs> yeah, was yeah, the, the far off 90s where copy machines were... <laughs> 
I mean, maybe you could have yeah, asked uh, Grandpa Fred to, you know, you know, give him some money for the copy machine at the university or whatever. But, but you know, that was it. Very simple. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we we talked about some articles like that, and you know, a nice simple graph of like, mm-hmm. look, the road in which they, the feedback was given did better with recycling. They increased the you know percentage of houses mm-hmm. with recycling bins out, and the the other road that was our control didn't. But really, you know, did you choose this or, or suggest we read this because it was just a nice kind of encapsulation of hey, guess what? It's do it's doable. It's totally do yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's to just serve as a model of that in look around where you live and who you're around that you can make a big impact by doing very small things. And you know, this is such a heartwarming article for so many reasons. I, I love that the reinforcer was that he he went out and went to the store and asked for gift cards from the grocery mm-hmm. store. And it wasn't that the people who recycled got the delivery of those gift cards it was that they would go to a homeless shelter Mm -hmm. right so it's yeah speaking to the collective effort of like the goodness in humanity (laughs) in a way right did you do a follow-up component analysis to look at whether it was the gift card or the handwritten notes that was the (laughs) (laughs) you know you know and the the reality is, is like this is a problem that we've all inherited by being here on earth at this time no one really wants to be working on it but we have an obligation to our children to make the changes that we can to create the world we wish to see for them. And this is a, just a very clean example of, of how you can make an, an impact in your own community. And, you know, I, I spoke about this a little bit before, but what I really, you know, hope comes across is the power of your individual behavior, especially as behavior in us. Like we have been given these incredible tools that are at our fingertips that we can make change. And I know we all have a lot on our plate and that we're, we're working with, but when you change your own behavior, there are a lot of positive outcomes that sometimes if you can't tangibly see it, you can easily get frustrated. But the first is that you're reducing your footprint by choosing to mitigate rather than you know amplify climate change. So that's mm. just a fact. Mm. Like any change you make is making a better tomorrow for, for the future. So never underestimate the power of your own actions, how small they may seem. And it's really up to us to decide the type of legacy we want to w- leave for our children. And by committing to small acts of change, you're making a bigger impact than you're probably giving yourself credit for. The second is that another big impact is that we're social creatures and we're constantly influenced by the actions of those around us. So by engaging in behaviors and committing to that change, you're providing a model to others and creating an opportunity for your behavior to be imitated. I'm talking to the observational learning queen right here, Jack. (laughs) No, but that happened with us, right? You started composting. And then we got composting in our town and both Diana and I did it. And I didn't know that you did that. Right. right. Like it's like, nope. But and that's that's what people fall into that trap. Like mm-hmm. I did it. You think it's just your individual behavior influencing, but it's actually many other people are yeah. me that you are. And you, you don't necessarily see that butterfly. But that, effect. that does bring up the question, though, of like, how much should you be talking about mm-hmm. your sustainability efforts? Right. Because I'm not like a big Self promoter, mm-hmm. I guess. Besides the fact that I have this podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just promote right, myself not, every well, week. Well, we just we just sort of have a discussion with a guest, and as far as we know, that's it. It goes somewhere, and maybe somebody mm-hmm. listens. You know, like we we don't. Yeah, but I'm not like, you know, if I if I'm doing something that I think is good, I'm not necessarily going to go around and tell everyone because I'm not just like not like kind of yeah. kind of gal. You just tell me, and I'll tell. But everyone. then again, maybe it is good to model that type of behavior if you are engaging in it so that other people know yeah. that it's happening well and it also it comes back in unexpected ways like so the that exact example in our own house like we've started that a few years ago and we live with my mother and she and she's a very social creature she has a lot of you know friends visiting yeah and every time they come and we clean up for dinner it's like oh they compost so you need to put this here mm. right and so like I, i'm not anticipating that i'm influencing 70 year old women Mm -hmm. about this but it ends up being this big conversation and then they're asking about how you can how how they can do this in their Mm -hmm. own home Mm -hmm. so it's like you don't even really sometimes need to put the active effort to have that influence it just kind of comes up like it might just like come up in the context of conversation but by doing that then you're supporting others like say you have a colleague at work that brings up composting or something you're like oh yeah we do that then that reinforces their own behavior you know Mm -hmm. what i mean so it's it's that collective change that if we're all doing these simple actions and encouraging each other to mm-hmm. to be the change we wish mm-hmm. to see, that then we're going to see those changes unfold. Mm-hmm. 
it's kind of more like social sciences, I guess, that I'm talking about, or sociology in a way. Sure. It seems like. <clears throat> but no, um, but there's change at the individual level, right? Completely. And so it's about reinforcers, punishers. Yep. So, like, thinking about longer term, right, and what happened in the past and what happened in the future. Like, mm-hmm. right now, what's happening right now is, yes. is totally operant. Wait, when will right now be? Hey, right now. <laughs> hey, Jack, you know what time it is? <laughs> Right now, hey. it's your tomorrow. It's your tomorrow. Oh my oh, I thought there was no tomorrow. No, it's your now. tomorrow. <laughs> I thought it's there was no Hager tomorrow. No, it's <laughs> your because this used to be my swimming song. So I listened to to pump my pump myself up. Oh man, you don't get really go tomorrow. for right now. Right now, clear Pepsi. Oh my, no. that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> clearly man. Canadian. That's oh, what I, had. I like clearly Canadian as well. Okay, sorry, oh, we have derailed. But wait, that's okay. The <laughs> Ta- wait, wait, us back in. It's everything. Right now. <laughs> it's your magic moment. Yeah, that's too much pressure. You're doing it. <laughs> right here, right now. Doing my best. Wait, wait. The best part? It means everything. It means everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. But to reel it back, like think about maybe another behavior that's more observable. Like if if you're going to a coffee shop for the first time and you've never used a reusable mug before and you're and you're bringing it up and you have all these internal questions, you're not sure, you know, are they gonna take it? Do I get a discount? When do I tell them? Mm. What's the size matter? You know, all this stuff, a little anxiety. And then you just dive into the, you know, interaction hoping for the best versus if you entered that coffee shop and the person in front of you had used a reusable mug. Like mm-hmm. you could watch that whole thing mm-hmm. unfold, right? And, yes. And, and learn through that. You um, can use reusable cups now at Starbucks post back? COVID. It's back. Yeah. Mm, good. Yeah. I have a lot of anxiety around those types of yeah, questions. I think a lot mm. of people do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, who do you ask these questions for? Mm-hmm. So it's, I guess my point is like, you never know if you're that person that has committed to that change of like, okay, that's the behavior that I, I is tangible for me. I can keep a cup in the car or whatever. You never know who you're inspiring to act. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? So I think it's, it's very powerful. Yeah. So make a lot, I think a lot of the recommendations and discussion points we've had so far really focus more on the individual or very like small social unit level. When we start talking about scaling up or working at a district or a neighborhood or a city or town or state, national, mm-hmm. whatever, global level, we do start running into a lot of problems. And I know one of the things you know that I kind of was thinking about in reading the Schneider article was how much changing behavior did seem to be like, you know, could we just, should, should we be thinking of sustainability and sustainable behavior as, you know, both the positive, but also the negative. What what are the kind of anti-sustainable behaviors? And could we do, you know, like an FA of like, well, what are the barriers to changing behavior? What's maintaining this behavior? Now, we were talking about businesses before and mm-hmm. the idea of well, a lot of kind of eco-unfriendly behavior that a business is going to engage in probably has a financial incentive that's mm-hmm. maintaining it. And, you know, maybe that's where a government, you know, mm-hmm. not that we want to rely on government, maybe that's where, you know, bigger change or, you know, big mm-hmm. picture change might need to go into it. Am I do I oversimplify the situation when we think of it as just one more behavior? Is it too complex to do that? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, our discussion has been talking about kind of smaller scale Mm -hmm. behaviors at the individual level. What you're getting at is like corporations and businesses and, you know, that's a whole other arena Mm -hmm. that I'll be honest, I'm not as fluent with and, you know, how to, to influence that. There are certainly... There are programs that I know Harvard has a sustainability program that you can get master's degrees in like climate policy mm-hmm. and being sustainability directors in corporations. I know like another big thing at the individual you can level that you can do is to try and divest your retirement savings away from some of these corporations. And there's a lot more companies where the designation is called ESG. I think it's environmental social. And, go, and something else justice uh, but with the g yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you can elect to put your money into companies that are committed to actually being a positive change and there's a lot of like grassroots things like robin hood they did something recently they're a hedge fund that mm-hmm. they were able to like i forget what company it is that'll drive me crazy they were able to take the leaders out of the organization at like the grassroots level by like not investing money in them. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of power that individuals have, even though sometimes you could feel powerless thinking about you versus Amazon. Mm. Right. But 
I think your the other part of your question was the simplicity in which we look at. Yeah, I mean, when we talk when we talk about kind of eco friendly behaviors, mm-hmm. are, are we talking about behaviors that you know one could just? I mean, it, it, the, like the way you described, uh, you know, the composting in in, in your mm-hmm. district, it was you know observing the behavior, you're getting a baseline, you're looking at what's the response effort for the new behavior, what's maintaining the old behavior. It, it, it's I mean, it sounded so simple, and I, and I think we've kind of come mm-hmm. back to like some of these pieces are really simple. Or do we, oh, you know, when I'm thinking about it, it's like, oh, it's just like any other behavior change process. I mean, am I yeah. oversimplifying it or am I diminishing I, me, the work you did? No, or? I don't think so. I think that's why we're we're primed to to help with this. Mm. The beauty of this is that you can look at any topography of behavior where you're that is considered high impact, meaning that you're reducing the amount of greenhouse gases mm-hmm. in the air. And so there's a number of different areas of behaviors that you could select to target it's not just i think you know we did composting a lot of people talk about recycling and mm-hmm. composting as being environmentally friendly but that doesn't necessarily equate with reduction of greenhouse gases at the level of which we need to see so yeah. i want to make the the point that there are a lot of other avenues and behaviors that we need to help shift mm-hmm. like you know Riding your car less. Mm. Stop idling in your car. Like, that's a pretty clear one of where you're pumping carbon into the air, uh, you know, unnecessarily. Right. And I don't know if it was you that told me this, Meg. It might have been. But, you know, I think we're all familiar with the green triangle and reduce, reuse, recycle. And I've always thought of it as like a circle, right? Like, oh, you could you can choose your own adventure, right? Like pick from any of these. But it's really intended to be like in a list. Like, first, we should try Mm -hmm. to reduce Mm-hmm. Then we should try to reuse what we already have. And then the third choice below that would be to recycle because it's less energy exactly. efficient yes. than the other two options. Mm-hmm. So for me, that kind of helped me reorder how I was thinking about completely what I'm doing, my yeah. behavior. Yeah, because the reduction of your personal consumption of goods is massive. Right. If you can if you can stop and there's so, you know, you're looking at your individual behavior you have to everyone behaves differently right so it's not like there's just one behavior for everyone that if we changed it it would work yeah but it's looking at like your own personal consumption habits you know whether it's you buy a lot of clothes or you're buying a lot of plastic toys off amazon Mm -hmm. do you actually need that like could you get it off of free cycle and you mean those those hatchables that i just bought (laughs) just kidding tiny little ones you like destroy (laughs) yeah just give them to someone when you're done yeah (laughs) <laughs> the one minute you break the egg and then you throw the egg yeah. away <laughs> but i think we were you know if people think about like what are some of the green behaviors yeah that people can work on and it really needs to be individualized and i, I really highly recommend looking at the drawdown list because there are so many things on there mm-hmm. and one piece that we haven't really talked about is there are a lot of things tied to social justice and climate justice on there, too. Like These are so in, intertwined that if you're working on come up, so many of those solutions, you're also working on climate solutions as well. Mm-hmm. So it's really kind of whatever hits close to home. Well, uh, kind of moving on to a little bit more on, on, the, on the Schneider article, I sort of you know mm-hmm. teased at the beginning. I, I did love that as for anyone who's sort of like, I'm going to dip my toe into sustainability and, and sustainable behavior as just a, a really... Nifty, I feel like I'm, I'm discounting all the work that went into it, but just really great kind of summary of like, Nifty. here are some of the ways that, you know, here's how reinforcement plays into changing behavior. Here's how the vari- a variable schedule could. And, you know, I think some of the suggestions in there, you know, especially if, if you've been in the field for a long time or you've read on, on the topic, feel like, yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. But so much of it does get into the intricacies of human behavior that, I, I like we talked about, don't always come through, I think, when just you know an initiative gets tried and this is true about a lot of initiatives in a lot of areas outside of just sustainability research but let's just do an initiative and and it sounds good and as long as we use reinforcement or we use an incentive we're going to see change and then kind of missing a lot of the other components that that we you know that we discussed and like you said in in composting in schools there were some you know reinforcers for some of the children but you, you specifically chose a schedule that was going to be manageable for mm-hmm, you, for you mm-hmm, to do mm-hmm. and it was more about the social recognition and like i think you said there were, like, there were small small prizes or was it just the social recognition oh yeah of course they were like you know they were like bracelets made out of recycled flip-flops mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know recycled pencils and things like they went crazy they were like notebooks that's yeah that's a really on-brand going... intervention there <laughs> it was a sustainability all the way through yeah and it- <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, it was it was a hit for sure. <laughs> but you know, but again, if if someone I think without a, a background in in behavior analysis or someone without a background in in behavioral economics or sustainability research might have just been like, "Hey, kids, I'm going to tell you all mm-hmm. the compost." Maybe they would have made it easy to compost, and maybe there would have been some sort of like elaborate reward mm-hmm. system that was on the teachers to do. And you know, teachers really love hearing. Here's one more thing that you have to mm-hmm. do in your classroom, and it may have fallen by the. Or you'd see it work for like a month or two. That novelty effect mm-hmm, of you mm-hmm. know, we'll have these assemblies and we'll put up the graph, and then eh, there's a new initiative, so we forgot about that one. And then you know, you see your 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 compost you know, rates slide. Definitely. Um, yeah. And that's a real problem because we're relying on volunteers right mm-hmm. in the community in order to to implement these things. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely a real yeah. real thing. <laughs> so so when when you looked at at the Schneider article, were were there either components in it that you felt were ones you'd never thought of or that you think are ones that are more salient to sort of a, you know, behavior analysts who are, are interested in learning more or kind of want to start maybe doing their yeah. own small projects? I mean, this this article is just amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like so to me, I think it's so well written and includes such a large amount of information in such a concise way. Mm-hmm. And I think we talked about it a little bit, but that this was really an effort to to have an interdisciplinary approach to let the communities outside of behavior analysis and sustainability efforts understand the value in which we have to offer. And I think she did a really great mm-hmm. job of that, of being able to kind of switch the vernacular a little bit so that it's more receptive to the general audience. I don't know if you, you've felt that as well. And Susan is so intelligent and articulate and devoted to this positive change. She's really a role model in the field and she's very helpful and supportive of behavior analysts trying to break into sustainability efforts. So I really can't thank her enough for actually just her guidance that she's helped help me along the way. That's awesome. And you know, one of the points that she really is trying to make is taking the time and effort to reach out in an interdisciplinary way that on, on both sides, that we need to articulate ourselves to people outside of our field better and that we also need to take the time to understand what other work people are doing in the mm. field to not be isolated. Because it's this collaborative approach in which we're going to get these big changes. And that there's a lot of work already being done by people devoted to sustainability efforts that embrace behavior analysis. So let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's, like, we don't need to have this fine, we're polished thing. Like, let's just kind of do what I did mm-hmm. in Newton and just do the best we can and create that shift. because. You know, there is a time piece to all of this that we need to start working on this. So one of the big resources where she's made a lot of connections is with Doug Mackenzie Moore, the book Fostering Sustainable Behavior. She, and she's working on trying to get him to ABAI. And Jay Kaiser, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He has Tools of Change, which is a website with a bunch of resources about these community-based interventions. So if mm-hmm. you want to do something and you're like, I want to work on this specified thing, you can go to these websites and look up what have people done. It's a community. It's like a network of here are some of the systems that are you know really helpful in order to do that. And so this article, I, I love it. <laughs> like I'll just go through and I'll be like, wow, and you can riff on anything, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can pull something out and be like, wow, this is so applicable to, to this problem. And some of the work I'm doing at with the New England Behavior Analyst for Sustainability is working on disseminating our principles to a broader audience. Mm-hmm. So trying to flush that out through blog posts or presentations, I feel like this is just a really good resource for both people wanting to learn more about associative learning and for our field as well, mm-hmm. for people working on the efforts. I did find, you know, I, I, I think talking about sustainability and, and book on sustainability, I, that, that definitely piques my interest and is one I'd like to look into because so so much of the article really gets to kind of its concluding points on looking at like, how are we creating sustainable habits? Like, it's not just about what are the trick little interventions we can throw into mm-hmm. place and aren't they fun? And look at that. We changed one behavior for two or three months and let's hope for the best. And then we moved on to the next one. It really is about mm-hmm. how are we creating the habits? The, I mean, they're the, the green habit uh, definitions, maybe not quite as precise as I would have liked the idea of, you know, it's a behavior that occurs with little or no conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. And, Okay, that's in the article. That's a quote. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not getting mentalistic on y'all, but really, that does get at so much of. I think the when I think of sustainable behaviors, the ones that I know I personally have gotten, you know, some mm-hmm. social reinforcement from, or 
even just enjoyed, dare I say it, enjoyed engaging <laughs> in were the ones that they just came. Uh, I don't remember whether it was Diana said, hey, let's do this, or it became easier to engage in the new behavior, mm -hmm. or I read something about it and said, hey, let's give it a try. But all of a sudden... Shout out to me. Just, <laughs> it wasn't Just me. became very easy to do and a part of my routine. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's not, you know, I've never been like incredibly eco-kind, in case you couldn't tell from the beginning of the podcast, not incredibly <laughs> eco-conscious about many of these areas, it just felt so easy. And it felt like this is haven't we been doing this all the time? Mm -hmm. and, and those are the sections I think in the article that I, I would just love to see more on because that does feel like a real keystone in some of these late, in these later, you know, look, looking into the future long-term maintenance projects. And I like you were mentioning looking at, at, you know, behavior of children as oh, yeah. if we can change children's behavior, you know, they're, they're always going to grow up knowing, well, this is how you reduce. This is how you, yeah. you know, I don't need all these things. Mm -hmm. And and that is really kind of a, a failing of the, adult generation and the generation before. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really seems like an area that would bear. We blame our parents. Yeah. Well, well now I mean, many we of us all... are the parents. So we <laughs> yeah, have to blame ourselves. We, we do have to give ourselves a break. We all inherited this problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, like it's, it's on, uh, it's no one wants to be working on this. <laughs> right. I mean, just like anytime we talk about maintenance and generalization of behavior, right. We have to think about what's happened in the training setting and then in the natural setting. And if the reinforcers that were in place in the training setting are no longer in place in the natural setting, then it's extremely unlikely that that behavior is going to maintain. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about identifying replacement behavior for behavior that's less sustainable, then whatever is going to function as the reinforcers in the natural setting have to be just as good as the reinforcers that were in place previously. You know, I have a selection of straws that are my reusable straws and I love them and I love them way more than plastic straws and I like won't use a plastic straw basically I almost always have one of my alternate oh, straws yeah. available and for me it's more reinforcing mm -hmm. once I found the straw right I had to find yeah, the right the straw error. exactly yeah. I had a whole selection but can we pro I want to problem solve on this Dinah because I love your straws no, I wash them I'm not no I'm not knocking oh, on the okay. straws but I always think of this because if I get like, you know, on usually on Saturdays, we get Dunkin' Donuts because we live in New England. <laughs> so, and, you, you know, when you get a nice coffee and they'll always give us a straw. And I know you're not going to use that straw, but the straw has still been made. It's still but, in my house. I'm now going to throw the straw in the trash. Well, that's when you pick it up. OK, but do you just tell them, don't give me a straw? Yeah, I, I hold have a up straw. my straw so I don't even have to talk. And she sees it. She goes, oh, good. And she doesn't give me a straw. So now I feel like we're talking about some of the social reinforcers that, Meg, that you were talking about, uh, or the, the, the anxiety mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. I A, either don't think of it, or B, get nervous when I think of it and say, I don't want to say anything. They're going to look yeah, weird right. at me. I'm going to get yelled at. They're going to throw a straw <laughs> at me her. anyway. But I don't have your straw. Well, I'll send it with you. I'm just going to bring it with me now. <laughs> Disney response ever. Yeah. Just have it hanging. You'll just have it hanging from the right? wind, like the rear of your mirror. <laughs> See, this feels like one of those areas where, like, the bigger companies or like the individual franchisees. Yeah, they should what if, want. A what if they asked, "Hey, do you want a straw?" Like, if that were the right. question, mm -hmm. like, make it easier on me, the consumer, because I don't want to mm -hmm. tell you, "Don't give me a straw," because I know, what, what if you think I'm being rude? Or I don't want your exchange. services. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say that. Or what if maybe I do need a straw later, and then I got to come back, and I'm so embarrassed because I yelled at you, "Don't give me that straw, mm -hmm. you pollute." Mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't it be better if they just said, "Would you like a straw?" Like, isn't thing, that the question? Some, right. Some organizations, I've, I've, I've experienced that more and more often. Now. I have mm -hmm. too, yeah. but. Wouldn't they not want to use it because it saves them money? They don't have to buy as many straws. Right? They don't have to mm -hmm. buy straws. Look straw. at that data. Mm -hmm. well, that's where the behavior analyst comes in. That's right? what I'll do right. next time I have the drive yeah. I won't say, don't give me a straw. I'll say, are you looking to hire a behavior analyst to observe the behavior related to your straw usage right? and maybe like, save you some money? It's six ninety five. There was a very long line <laughs> behind you. Or, Please leave. Or when you're like at a fast food restaurant and they give you 100 ketchup packets. Mm -hmm. They don't need more. Those are on shortage. Yeah. Oh, really? I have. Yeah. yeah. I feel like they're hard to get these. I days. have so many. Yeah, they'll give you like one. <laughs> well, that's great. If you ask, they'll give you more. If you like beg for them. <laughs> oh, really? I did not know this. I but guess anyway, I haven't I, been to a fast food restaurant stands. in a while. But yeah, right. Your point stands. Yes. I guess two years ago when you went to a fast food restaurant and right. there was a surplus of ketchup. <laughs> yeah, but the but the I mean maybe that, that was the point, man. Good job, you've made us all start thinking about sustainability more. But that, but that I don't feels know like another. Caused, yeah. It feels like another area of. <laughs> 
you know, an area of like easy research because that one totally, would be yeah. like a win-win because you're right. The company can save money if they're doing less straws. They mm-hmm. know it's going to look. I mean, what company wouldn't want to say, hey, everybody, we've saved the lives of so many animals by cutting down mm-hmm. the use of straws in our company by simple question. And it doesn't really matter if they're also saying, and actually the main reason yeah. we did it is because we saved millions of dollars and all the plastic we're not, you know, forced to buy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, w- w- whatever, whether they, they can just look good, have everyone say what a great conscious, com- you know, ecologically conscious company they are. Um, but at the end of the day, who cares? We still have produced less waste. You know, we've reduced the need for yeah. the, the yeah. Pl- plastic straws. And you could build the research around, you know, testing... <sighs> How the interaction is best received maybe by the customers, right? Because yep. I'm sure a lot of this is about customer service. Right. And it's a little right. bit controversial in that some people <clears throat> may need to use a straw and may not want to carry one mm-hmm. with them. So mm-hmm. if you have some type of disability, yep. then it may mm-hmm. be that you are necessitate a straw and that should be available to you. Yes. If it's something that you need. Mm-hmm. So we wouldn't want to eliminate the option, but maybe there could mm-hmm. be. And like I also feel bad that it's someone probably could ask if you need it. Automatic behavior when you're trying to like churn out orders to just be like, it's an iced drink. Mm-hmm. I have to get, I grab the straw and I hand them because I'm sure they probably didn't give someone a straw once. And I'm sure the answer wasn't like, oh, could you please give me a straw? Or oh, what an environmentally conscious employee yeah. you are. They probably got yelled at. You know, yeah. where's your manager? I need a straw. What, how do you think I'm drinking this? You of know, course. there probably was a bit aversive around it. And these are people making minimum wage, yep. right? Just, you know, doing doing their hard work. Yep. Yeah. Well, now we've made something that sounded so simple, sounds so complicated all of a sudden. Not impossible complicated, no. but like thoughtful complicated. Like put the time well, in and yeah. we can come up with mm-hmm. the solution. Yeah. If we were really focused, we could put our brains around how to design a study to figure out what is the most effective use to re- the most effective way to reduce the amount of straws that are delivered in mm-hmm. like a, a drive drive through. Mm-hmm. I know Jackie and Diana could do it. We actually had that I, idea. I had already. it all set up and then COVID happened. Yeah. Did you? Mm-hmm. It was going to happen at our. Our coffee shop at our, at our library. Wow. So maybe someday. Yep. <laughs> Full disclosure, yeah. I just read that proposal and I stole it. No, it like <laughs> yeah. <my> great. <laughs> Rob, Rob no, no, no. I, I, yeah. I, I, no, I no. vaguely remember now you're yeah. mentioning we talked. We didn't even talked. get to IRB. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob was the IRB reviewer. He's like, that's a great idea. Stealing uh, it. No, I said, terrible. Yeah. No, can't do just this kidding. study just so I could keep hmm. it. Yeah. <laughs> so That's awesome. Just I kidding. Hope, I hope you're able to pick it up. Someday. Yeah. Someday. So, Meg, before we wrap up, is there uh, any other section in the Schneider and colleagues article that you feel, you know, deserves a- additional attention from from listeners? You know, if they're picking this article up to to look more into the research? Yeah, I would I would point to delay discounting because it represents the process underlying sustainabi- sustainability issues in that our everyday behavior is more likely to be influenced by immediate consequences rather than long term mm. removed consequences. So it's really a scientific reason why we're not acting on climate change. You wrote a whole blog on that. Yeah. And check it out. Thank you. Really segue, good. Jackie. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so delay discounting. We've talked about a lot of the principles. It sounds like we're ready to talk about them all in a summary we like to call the dissemination station. I thought we made that up, but someone else made it up. What? Dissemination station? Yeah. I, I think we made it up. Mm, I don't know. I think we might have made it up. Who else made I it up? I kind of thought that we were going to slide on in here on an electric train this time. Though. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Not a coal-based train, right? <laughs> you can't even hear it? No, you can't even hear it. Right. Here we go. <laughs> Silent. We're here. Whoa. Well, I want to be on one of those Meg Maglev trains yeah. that goes, you know, well, hundreds of miles an hour. We've made it. <laughs> now I've plugged myself in to a solar panel. Oh, wow, really? What? Is the future? Is that how yeah. that works? Wow. Yep. And now, You'll uh, never run out of battery. Nope. Unless, and my, cloud, unless it's cloudy. Yeah. And my train now <laughs> is recharging. Okay. okay great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Meg, we, we've discussed, you know, so many areas of action. Are there any in particular that you want to make sure, you know, if the listeners thought of, you know, had one thing, you know, that you incepted into them after listening that they're going to go change their sustainability behaviors tomorrow what what do you think would be the most important whether it's a behavior or something they should learn about well i think if i'm talking to the behavior analytic community i would recommend that they look at their surrounding community and make a data-driven decision on what would be the most impactful thing to to do Mm -hmm. really the basics of integrating ourselves into environmental groups and in our communities of of simply doing 
let's like sit down and figure out what is a high impact behavior that we all agree that we want to work on. Doing that is like the best way to like get started on a project. And if you can do that, then it's a really efficient use of everyone's time, right? And you know that you are causing a positive change in a way. You know, and to that end, just want to restate that as behavior analysts, we're so empowered. We have the tools, the knowledge, and the skills to change behavior. And whatever your interest is in behavior analysis, there's a need within the climate change to community to pursue that question more. And so I hope I've inspired some people to act and to join us in being part of the solution and not, you know, continue to be part of the problem, but to be easy with yourself in the process. Cause this is, this is a, a hard, complex problem. And so find your group, find your community. If you don't have one, please reach out to us at the New England Behavior Analysts for Sustainability. If you want to find us the easiest, I, f- I always, I love the good old Google. I find that's the easiest. <laughs> Google. Search New England Behavior Analysts for Sustainability. But you can find us at sustainabilitynewengland.org and there's a link to contact us. We haven't talked much about this group, but we're a group of behavioral scientists dedicated to creating a more sustainable world. And we're really a verbal community committed to integrating behavior analysis into sustainability efforts. Because we know the more we talk about this, the more likely we are to commit to action. So our goals are really to integrate behavioral practices into our communities where we live, work, and volunteer, and also to disseminate behavioral principles, not only to our behavior analytic community, but to those outside the field as well. So we've presented at multiple conferences. We have a blog that you can follow. We're it's on, so awesome. Thank you, Jackie. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And some of our members also are offering to provide resources for practicum students to do supervision hours oh. on the topic of cool. sustainability. So if there are some inspiring BCBAs out there that want to focus on that, we what are offering that. No, I'm taking we might hold know of that. that. Yeah. A couple? Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe 20. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone's interested in something and you need exactly. those hours. Why don't you pick something that's not, you know, the, you know, the, the only games in town. Exactly. There are a lot of other areas to look at. That's excellent. Mm-hmm. And so we're definitely, we're looking to expand our reach and get the word out to more people through social media and a wider representation of different communities mm. too would be great. So, and we'd also love to hear about what other people are doing at their individual level to connect. Ooh, I just love that. That's excellent. Of, of what you've done there. Oh, thank you. And Jackie. I love your blog. Appreciate it. And can I keep pumping them out for you, for y'all. <laughs> Thanks. Good. We got to spread it. You know, if we got some marketing people out there that can help us yeah. spread the word a little bit, that's what I mean, we need help doing. Blog writing seems harder than podcasting. I, I think. agree. You just got to keep writing you? new content. Oh, yeah. 100%. It's funny. I hated writing in graduate school and now I find it really easy. You know what? Get out of here. Yeah, but I think, I think, I think <laughs> no, you, get, you, like, you get to a certain knowledge level and it's like it just kind of comes yeah. more. You know? I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> maybe another five to ten years. Uh, oh, well, Meg, thank you so much for coming yeah. on the show. It was so exciting to, the, the, you know, a topic like Diana said, you know, we talked about way, way back when and it's sort of been been a long time. So we're really glad we got a mm-hmm. chance to to have you on and to talk about sustainability and research and some other resources that listeners can look out to. And we'll have a link to the, the group on in the show notes and on the website as well. So people have many ways that they can find it. In addition to just Googling yeah, it, which right. <laughs> is, continues to be the lowest response ever to find anything. <laughs> oh, well, I guess that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it was our <laughs> pleasure. And the nice thing about podcasts is you don't really need to reduce too much. You just go forever and it only uses whatever electricity you need, our I time. guess. Our t- <laughs> But that's a renewable resource. A resource. No, it's not. I'll recycle your time. I don't know <laughs> I how I'll do that. I wish my time could be recycled. Get, get a time All machine. All that crappy TV that I've watched in my life, I would recycle. There's a reduce. That's a reduce right there. <laughs> uh, no thanks. <laughs> well, we hope you, the listeners, enjoyed listening to ABA Inside Track. Before we go, I want to remind you of a couple of things, including our second secret code word, our guest code word. It is ostrich. O S. T-R-I-C-H. Ostrich is a large, flightless bird that lives in... Where does, it, where does an ostrich live? I don't know. But to their defense... South America? Can I just say something about ostriches? Sure. Because I looked it up. So people talk about them putting their head in the sand, mm-hmm. that they're not looking. That's not what they're doing in oh. their defense. They're pretending to be rocks. Oh. So that predators don't see them. They're pretending to be rocks? They've been mischaracterized. Yeah, they're oh. just being like still like it's Jurassic Park oh. or something. Oh. One time, my dog escaped from me and ran into Franklin Park Zoo in Boston. 
which is kind of hilarious. And I had to chase after him, her, into the park. And when I got into the park, she was being chased by an ostrich. Wait, how did the ostrich get out? It was just walking around the park. It was like one of the free roaming birds. No, ostrich is scared. Aren't they kind of mean? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was a they- peacock. <laughs> They're very That's different great. birds. Yeah, worry. Peacock. Sorry. Maybe they are African. Yeah. I'm not actually yeah, long, sure. Long, long. I, th- I think yeah. they are. No, no, no. An it's African a peacock. Animal. I got them mixed up. But anyway, but don't the keyword. Like, the keyword is ostrich. 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 Not peacock. Peacock no. already was a I word. Thought you were solar powered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a glitch. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> ostrich. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thanks to everyone there for listening. There are a lot of ways that you can enjoy the show, and, and we love to hear from you. You certainly can subscribe or find us on all the social media outlets, pumping out all our, our content. You can certainly send us an email at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, where you can purchase CEs, find links to the articles, as well as links to uh, amazing groups like NEBOS, the New England Behavior Analyst for Sustainability. Okay. Amazing groups like New England Behavior Analysts for Sustainability, or as, as Meg said before, Nebos, which is yeah. whatever's whatever sticks. <laughs> what I love is my episode. I've been listening to a podcast recently, and they say, or you can leave us a five star review, <laughs> or you can uh, yeah, if you want to leave us a review, a five star review, that's great too. But you I know, feel like free to say like they're suggesting like or not four, five, right. Five star. Yeah, review. if you want to leave us one star, get out of town. We don't want to hear it. Just I five do, star. Because we according do. to our ethical code, we need to accept. And accept and do something about feedback. I would say if you want to give us a one-star review, you should email us directly at abinsidetrack at gmail.com to tell us what you think is wrong with our show. And then maybe we can fix it. And then you can, you know, we could give you can give us a better review after that, perhaps. Find these episodes also on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. And if you're interested in even more content, join us on patreon.com slash abinsidetrack, where for $5 a month, you can subscribe to get a little bit early access as well as some other goodies. And we'll be updating those, those tiers for the fall as well. So keep an eye out there. Again, big, big thanks to Dr. Megan Martineau for joining us tonight. Also, some big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for interstitial music, Dan Thabit of Podcast Doctors for his editing work, and Hollis Irvin for his visual design. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye Bye-bye!